Well, it's a pleasure to be with you uh, this afternoon. And, uh, you know, part of that is, gee, I'm glad I could travel here, that there was not any environmental conditions preventing that, and that those same environmental conditions allowed you to actually join us here today, because that's always a challenge. Um, as, as we go in, through this uh, discussion today, I want to define for you conception rate from a reproductive physiologist's point of view, and that would be a pregnancy as a result of a single insemination. And when I think about pregnancy rate, I think of how many are pregnant of a total group in a defined time period. And so for me, pregnancy rate is usually an endpoint, and conception rate tells me how fast I might be getting there. So while we talk about things related to conception, it doesn't necessarily say anything about what our uh, final pregnancy might be because over time we might uh, overcome some of these stressors. So just uh, that, that to start with. And we're going to talk about a variety of stressors. Uh, we'll spend the most time on, on temperature. And if we think about the temperatures we've had this winter, um, I heard something that it was 20 degrees colder today than, than normal. And maybe when we look at the average of February, it's going to show very cold as well. The thing that comes to my mind as we see variability, will we also see extremes in our summer temperatures? And when might those occur? And so as we think about what our normal calving and breeding period is, will we have some challenges if we see more variability on when warm temperatures come to us? And so we'll, we'll talk about some of the effects of essentially heat stress, a little bit about nutrition from a very uh, short period of time. Justin will talk about nutrition from a more, more global perspective. Talk a little bit about temperature and transportation stressors, and even less about disease and inflammation, but just want to highlight those so you think about this stress from a broader <coughs> perspective. So if we start with... Um, heat stress, the bulk of the data that's available is from the dairy industry, which experiences very profound effects of heat stress. This particular data set showing 17 years of data is from Israel, and they do a, a lot of work in their herds there related to heat stress. You see they sh in the blue bars is their winter. Um, this would be conception rate to the first insemination, and the summer is in the red. You know, you look at that, it's roughly in half. Uh, this black line then represents the mean maxim, maximum August temperature. Probably that would be their extreme. And you see that where those peaks are, also you see some of the very lowest responses. And that's very typical in the, the dairy industry. And when we think of that dairy cow, recognize she is a tremendous factory producing milk she eats a high-powered diet. She has a lot of heat, um, metabolic heat from consuming all that feed and, and metabolizing it. So she is probably going to be much more susceptible to heat stress than our beef cows because we're, we're really pushing that cow. And, of course, we're pushing some of our beef cows. But un understand we're rarely feeding the level of diet that, that they are to our beef cows, and, and that contributes to some of the, the stress. Now, I want to kind of step through some periods that help us understand uh, how heat stress shows up or impacts the reproductive process. Uh, this is some data out of Mexico, and they looked at a variety of different time periods in relation to insemination. And this second day prior to the day of breeding was one of the key days they found with a higher relationship uh, to subsequent conception rates. Now, we have two lines here. One line, the, the red line that I've overwritten here, is go looking at time periods from May through September. And so we think about that period, it's going to be getting warmer and warmer over time. The September through January period, temperatures are going to begin to be cooling down. So we have conception rate on this axis, and then the temperature humidity index um, on this second day prior to, to breeding. And so as we look at that, we see that 
as we go through warmer, a period where temperatures are warmer, and this, of course, um, just we don't know what month these temperature humidity index points were reached necessarily, but we see that uh, um, at the lower points there in this May through September period that we have a little bit higher conception rate at the s same temperature humidity index that we have in this September through January period. And so that says sometimes these, these animals have been used to heat stress, okay, they get used to uh, acclimatize themselves to whatever the environment is, and that's a feature of our animals. So at this lower uh, level of heat stress, we see higher conception rates. Then as we go through um, higher periods, you know, higher THI, more heat stress, then um, those lines become more similar. But the, the point is two days prior seems to be important to impacting conception rates, and we'll look at that a little further. And then secondly, that animals can adjust to, to temperature changes. And we know that's true in cold weather as well as warm weather. It's when we get those sudden changes, you know, if it was 80 degrees tomorrow, our animals would be really stressed. Okay, we might smile, but they would be stressed. Now, if we look at uh, some of the summary of literature on what's going on in relation to follicular growth and heat stress, uh, this cartoon kind of helps us understand and just want you to focus on the growth of the uh, follicle here and that uh, is going to occur over uh, several, <coughs> an extended period of time and as it gets closer to oblatory size it is much more sensitive to heat stress which would support what I showed you in the previous slide and if they're very small so within that ovary, there are follicles that are just kind of waiting for their turn to do something else. Those do not seem to be impacted by the heat stress, which is a good thing, which says when we come out of that heat stress, we can re return to normal fertility. We haven't damaged those primordial cells. Okay, so we, we said there's impacts on that obligatory follicle in relation to heat stress. This is a little study done in Mississippi using environmental chambers on some Hereford heifers and essentially they placed them in these chambers either 70 degrees or 90 degrees for 72 hours after they were inseminated and you can see those in the higher temperature virtually none of those conceived as a result of just that three-day period of heat stress right after <coughs> insemination. You see a, a very elevated temperature and their respiration rate was increased. So we're seeing the effect through three days. Let's go on to day four or five. Now we're looking at embryos produced in vitro and we're looking at stressing those environmental, essentially the petri dishes, the chambers where those are grown to different temperatures. We have embryos coming from uh, different um, types and breeds of cattle, and this shows three different studies. We have either a, a, what would be a normal culture temperature or an elevated temperature to create the heat stress, and this is development to the blastocyst stage, uh, which would be a measure of the growth of that embryo. So in this first set of data, we see that both Angus and Holstein were, had virtually no development in those heat stress groups. Uh, Brahmin, more heat tolerant, uh, a reduction, but not near to the effect in the Angus and Holstein. Uh, next set of data, we have Angus, Brahmin, and Rama Sinola, which is also a heat tolerant breed. And you see that the Angus had that lower number developing to blastocyst stage. Uh, the third set of data then includes uh, Nelore. Nelore is a breed uh, common in Brazil and again very heat tolerant and uh, th this is probably not even statistically different that the heat stress did not impact those embryos on day four or five of development. Uh, the other thing we know is that these Nelore cattle seem to lend themselves very well to in vitro fertilization type um, 
situation. So whether that's part of this effect here, I don't know, but they are, can use that technology quite readily in that breed of cattle. Now, so let's go on a little bit further. We've seen an effect from two days prior to breeding up to day five. This is now looking at using embryo transfer to deal with heat stress. So the solid line is animals that received an embryo. So that's really testing. The, the embryo came from a non-heat setting, but we put it into a cow that's heat stressed. And so we see that in this summer period, we're south of the equator, um, time periods are reversed. Notice this, the pregnancy rate is much higher in the ET pregnancies than the AI uh, cattle. So the effects we're seeing in the oocyte show through here, a lower pregnancy rate in those during the summer, returns to a higher level during the winter. What this shows us, and, and there's actually been a, I've read at least three modeling papers where using the combination of the, the challenge with heat stress and the fact that we see this difference in fertility, secondly, that we can use sex semen and um, develop embryos in vitro to be very, be very selective about the females that are producing our replacement heifers so that we do some embryo transfer in our lower end cows and we're putting in very good embryos to make uh, heifer calves, generate our replacement numbers, have a higher fertility than we would if we just used AI. And in the most recent uh, combination of that um, modeling paper, 40% embryo transfer really optimized the, the return in this commercial dairy that they modeled. So, you know, we're not ready to think about that in the beef industry, but with their genetic information and the use of this reproductive technology, you know, that's an economic reality for some of those uh, operations, depending on just what their, how, how well the modeling paper matched what the true costs are. All right, we have a little bit of data on the beef side. And this study is uh, from the University of Nebraska, and you may have heard of Terry Mader, who is responsible for most of the information, a lot of what we have about heat stress in feedlot cattle. He uh, was located in northeast Nebraska, where the temperature and the humidity created an in a great environment to study that. But he teamed up with um, Rick Rasby and others to look at their herd in southeast Nebraska. They used 10 years of data uh, this is a composite herd, British Continental Cross, and they start breeding in late May and uh, continue then uh, in, uh, for a 60-day period. Now, some years they bred for longer than that in that 10-year period, but they cut it off if, if they did. So as you look at this pregnancy rate, that's part of the reason that may look lower to you. But this just shows us the average conditions then over that 10-year period for the 30-day period prior to the start of the breeding season, uh, the first 21 days, second 21 days, and, and beyond that. So that's the average of all of these things. So the average, average temperature during that time, the average minimum temperature, maximum, relative humidity. Here's the uh, uh, temperature humidity index. Uh, solar radiation is an important part, we'll see and you see their accumulated precipitation and wind speed. They don't quite come to our Kansas standard for, for wind speed, but, uh, and then that, that's the pregnancy rate. So they, they used all this data, assumed that based on when they calved, we're gonna say conception date is 283 days before that. Now we know that that's not gonna be uh, exact because there's variation in gestation length, but you know they needed to do something in order to model this data set. So they assumed that was the day of conception, and they used all of this weather data and then all of the uh, assumed conception data. And th this would be something Bob would just relish in, a great big model with all these numbers, and we'd beat on them until they told us something. Well, I'm gonna try and highlight some of the things that, that they learned from that. <laughs> 
And one of the things they tried to do then is say, which of these weather factors can we use to predict what the conception was in this uh, situation? And if they looked at the first 40 days, then the minimum temperature, the temperature humidity index, wind speed, and solar radiation accounted for the largest percent of that variation. And if we limit it just to that first 21 days, you see that those same factors were important, although they didn't explain quite as much of the variation. Uh, this data set also supported the importance of this minimum temperature as an important factor of determining whether or not uh, conception occurred. So the ability to recover uh, from one day to the next, and we'll look at that a little more closely here in a, in a moment. Um, all right, so we talked about that, the lower nighttime temperatures, and then um, we, we know that there's this adjustment to the weather and that as we go through the summer, it's not like gradually warmer, warmer, warmer. We sometimes get, you know, you know the effect. I remember 80, day, 80 degree days last March and seeing poor little calves panting in that, that temperature. So uh, they're... Uh, While well, the animals can adapt, some of these uh, up and downness of our temperatures makes it challenging to totally predict some of these things. All right, I want to talk just briefly about bulls then. And let me uh, show you uh, what, what's all in these little lines. They wanted to look at how long do we have to heat stress a bull before we see impacts on semen production. So on the bottom of each of these slides, it's going to be weeks after uh, they, they collected for semen for these bull, from these bulls for eight weeks after one of four temperature challenges. The controls were just in the normal environmental conditions, and they did do this over a several month period. So you see some ups and downs to there. Then they either exposed them for 12 hours, 24 hours, or six days in a heat-stressed chamber. And so then we have uh, four different uh, characteristics of semen quality, and we'll look at that a little more closely here. So the top two, the first the, on top is the motility index. How qu quickly um, are those uh, cells moving? Do they appear to be vibrant in our sample? And you can see that in uh, the case of all of the heat stress, we had some initial decline. Uh, the low point is coming, um, maybe this is like six weeks after the exposure, all right? So it's important to understand that the heat stress impacts on semen quality. In fact, those that are very schooled in semen evaluation by looking at the changes that they see in those cells and the damages, they can about pinpoint when heat stress or illness, which would cause the same thing, occurs. So we, we see this decline and then they rebound. Uh, number of live sperm then, same pattern, more extreme heat, uh, the, the longer and deeper the decline for both live sperm and motility. Uh, then we go to primary and secondary abnormalities and think of those as um, less mature and, and excuse me, um, different levels of maturity. These are more mature, uh, these are less mature, and so we see these show up in these more mature cells earlier in relation to when the heat stress was, and now we see way more abnormalities from this uh, six day heat stress, then the 24 hour, not so bad on the, uh, the 12 hour. And the same type of pattern in the primary abnormalities, but it's just a little bit later. Okay, so whether it is environmental temperature or the bull running a fever, and probably the same thing could be true of uh, frostbite in, in the conditions we have right now, we could have some inflammation of that scrotum and some additional heat there to cause the same type of damages. It's a delayed effect, and when we... All right, pick you off. All right, so if we think just about some practical things dealing with heat stress, um, if in, around here it seems like our peak temperature is often 
uh, late afternoon so that if the environmental temperature peaks at 4 o'clock, the animal's temperature is going to tend to peak two hours later, and it's probably going to take another six hours for that animal to recover. So if we think about um, when we want to work animals during warm weather, you know, it does cool off in the evening sometimes, but really we'd be better off from their heat load level to, to do that in the morning when they've had all night to recover. Now, if we're talking about animals that are uh, on a, our grazing cows are not going to have a consistent heat of production like um, animals, either dairy cows or feedlot calves that are fed at a certain time of day. But if we're dealing with that, then know that that heat of production from feed intake is going to peak about four to six hours after um, that feeding. All right. And we think about another management thing to think about, we're, we're struggling with controlling flies. And as we think about the animals bunching up to try and stomp and fight those together, if you're in the middle of that pack, you might be good from the standpoint of more tails and head knocks, knocking the flies off of you, but it's probably warmer there in the middle of the pack than the outside. And that can contribute to heat stress effects. And um, you know, it should be no doubt in our mind that our pastured cattle suffer uh, from heat stress of times. If you've ever seen um, cows lined up behind the shade of a telephone pole and, you know, that little bit of shade, and now maybe you're, you have too many trees around here compared to western Kansas, but in western Kansas where there's not a lot of trees, that telephone pole and shade, they, they find that and, and appreciate that little bit of shade. So what else is in your environment is, can be very helpful uh, to dealing with that heat stress as well. Now, soon our Mesonet, which is kind of our weather data site at uh, K-State, is going to include this comfort index, which really came about from some of that data, partially from that data I showed you from Nebraska, that has the temperature humidity index, wind speed, and solar radiation all combined into that. And so this will allow you to look at um, current conditions. You should also be able to go back and get historic values. For example, one of the things, part of the reason this came about was my discussion with one of the climate guys on, can you generate this THI for me during this period out of a location that I was interested in? Because we had some uh, challenge with conception rate in some heifers. And so uh, anyway, this will be live soon, hopefully, and that will give you some ability to, to look at what that index is um, for the uh, coming days and uh, hopefully help you manage. All right, I want to go on and talk uh, quickly then about some nutritional stressors. And again, this is short-term impacts. And I really uh, appreciate the message that we can get from this study. They used grazing and different grazing allocations to look at the effect of nutrition pre and post breeding in some yearling heifers. And so the, the low nutrition, they had about 80% of what they might normally allot for forage. So they're, they're, as they looked at stocking density and area, they, uh, their, their estimate was about 80% of normal. Then the high group was estimated to have twice what their maintenance requirements is in terms of grazing allotment. And you think about when we're trying to estimate um, how much is growing in the spring, how quickly that forage is coming on, 80% may not be too far from some of the things that we experience when our estimation of how many we turned out and what the weather conditions allowed, um, we might get there pretty quick. So. In this study, then, they applied those levels either pre- or post-breeding. So we had a two-by-two, low-low, low-high, high-high, and high-low. Well, when they came from a situation of abundance and then went to lack of abundance after breeding, we saw that's where we had a low embryo survival, low conception rate in those individuals. Now, those that were used to the 80%, they were able to manage that all, all right. But this short-term stressor of abundance and then lack of abundance 
had a negative impact on conception. Another study shows maybe some of the reasons for that. Here they tried to synchronize follicular growth using a uh, progestin device, gave prostaglandin, and started this follicle growing. And as they gave this prostaglandin shot, then they gave two different levels of nutrition. Either they stayed on this 120% of maintenance, again, this would be uh, heifers, or they took them way down to about 40% of maintenance. Now, that's a pretty good restriction. If we look at what happened to uh, follicular development, we see that we reduced uh, the maximum size of this ovulatory follicle by about one millimeter. And generally, when that happens, we see reductions in fertility and um, st steroid hormone production would all be, be impacted there. If we look at this next follicle that came up, so now you know the total length of this period is just less than two weeks. The second follicle that came up, we decrease that diameter by three millimeters in this case. So that's pretty significant hit. And then only about half of those animals ovulated in that 40% uh, of maintenance treatment. Now that's a pretty severe restriction but notice that that severe restriction just essentially shut off half of those animals, okay? Um, this, this data set comes, um, initially they were interested in some early weaning studies and, and uh, it's a multi-state effort, so they early weaned these calves and then they uh, had some of them in a dry lot situation and some of them they had in kind of uh, a more typical yearling uh, situation, slow growth over the winter on a, a grazing range situation. When they went to grass the next spring, what happens to those that were uh, normal in the dry lot over winter? They lost about three pounds a day the first two weeks they were out on grass. This, um, you know, so this is not no gain, this is losing a lot of weight now this wasn't their aim in looking at this, but from this point they wanted to study this further, particularly as it relates to replacement heifers where we often do the same thing. And so here we have um, four different locations where the experienced animals were those that were um, overwintered in a grazing situation uh, compared to the naive, so these would be naive to grazing and they were developed in a dry lot. Both groups came together for synchronization and AI period and then uh, turned out together uh, to summer pasture. And you see the different uh, levels of early gain. You see that uh, three of those locations uh, really very little gain in those dry lot heifers and one group not so severely impacted. But when we look at pregnancy rates then we have about a 10% reduction in, in relation to um, how they were managed over winter. So the idea is that either they won't, weren't used to grazing or they didn't uh, uh, know how to graze what was there or didn't, uh, was, was, they were naive to that situation, didn't perform. They went on to put pedometers on uh, heifers in a similar situation, so they had the green bar is heifers in a dry lot, then the yellow is uh, on uh, grass, and you see, as you would expect, the uh, cattle that are on grass have, are, are taking more steps than the dry lot animals, and that holds true for this period prior to uh, synchronization, or excuse me, this is, well, yeah, see, actually they were synchronized in here, and then they, they go to summer grass together. And what happens then when this dry lot group goes out to summer grass, you see they've about tripled the number of steps for several days over those that were used to uh, be being on native grass. And you know, if you think about turning a yearling out into a new piece of pasture, what might they do? Oh, wow, and they're used to having somebody bring them feed. They haven't grazed on their own. Uh, since they had a cow providing for them. So we've created a stressor. While in our mind we're thinking, oh, they're finally to grass, life is good. It takes them a little while to, to appreciate that good. And that just is try to help you with that scale.
All right. Uh, we have just a little bit of data on transportation stress. Here they moved uh, two loads of heifers, either 1 to 4, 8 to 12, or 29 to 30 days after uh, artificial insemination. We see a reduction in pregnancy rate in those that were transferred. You know, this is getting, now the embryo is in the uterus. Uh, uh, recognition of pregnancy is occurring in here. And I guess I have those on, on this slide here, giving us this time period of what's going on here. But we really think that transportation from uh, while it's in the uterus up until complete attachment is probably detrimental. Uh, there's been some additional work try to get at that a little closer. But the challenge is, as you try to apply treatments, you may be applying stress and applying the treatment, and it gets confounded. And plus, can I haul your heifers? Because I think I might lose some pregnancies there. And everybody's jumping up and down to say, let me help you with that study. So um, th the bottom line is, I th we, we think we want to be very cautious of stress during that early period. How much? I don't know. Probably has a lot to do with how you handle and manage your cattle and um, what, what they're used to. And maybe as we look at some of this temperament data, that will help us. Uh, I think maybe both of these things might combine themselves. Ronaldo Cook was a graduate student in Florida, did several um, temperament studies with uh, Brahmin influenced cattle in Florida, then went to Oregon, where he repeated most of those in Hereford Angus cows. And that's what uh, this data represents. They scored those cattle on, uh, made a combined score from uh, an exit score. So did they dash out of the chute like a sprinter, or did they walk out and on their way? And the second uh, way they score those is when they stand in the chute, do you think the chute's going to fall apart, or they step in there and um, be very pleasant? So they, they categorize those. Um, this would be like they're three and under, um, and the more excitable groups. And you see a higher level of cortisol, which is our indication of stress, significantly different. Uh, turns out a higher pregnancy rate in those with adequate temperament. And all in all, they estimated in their system there was about a $60 per calf advantage in those adequate temperament cows. Um, looking then at replacement heifers, this again is these Hereford Angus uh, heifers in Oregon. They, after weaning, they went, uh, they, either nothing was done or half of them then were three times a week. They were taken through the chute. First week, they just walked through the chute. Then eventually they stopped them, caught their heads. So they kind of get this gradual process. Had done the same study in um, Brahmin influenced heifers in Florida. Here we see we have this elevated cortisol then in those that are not used to being handled, and a delay in puberty then in those heifers that weren't used to being handled. And the same type of effect then they saw in the Brahmin influenced. And if we try to summarize some of this temperament data then, when we have less cortisol then, our gonadotropin secretion seems to be more normal, and that then shows temperament differences and uh, earlier pregnancies in the Bos Indicus influence. Uh, when they repeat those in Nalor cattle, again, this is a Brazilian breed, uh, they were able to show a a higher AI pregnancy rates in that situation. So uh, as we apply this, we, we have to appreciate that how we handle those animals and which ones we choose to keep around that really high-headed animal could be really having detrimental effects on your rest of your herd because you know when one is all excited, soon the rest of them become that way. Okay, just quickly then, a slide about uh, disease-type stressors, and this is not a complete coverage, but it kind of fits with some of this early conception things, is that we know that we have, if we have persistently infected uh, individuals in our breeding herd, that that can cause embryonic loss. And even if your herd is well vaccinated, if you, a PI is created from some exposure across the fence, um, that, that can have negative consequences on this early conception rate. And secondly, another thing we see happening is that um, 
you know, we think each time we give a vaccination, each animal responds wonderfully and, and everybody got all their vaccine, everything's great. Well, indeed, not 100% of them respond for an, any number of reasons. And so as we look at administering vaccinations prior to breeding, we need to recognize that if any, anything that's naive to BVD and we're trying to give that uh, close to breeding, we could clearly have an ovarian response that is, is similar to what uh, we saw from nutritional changes. They just stop for a while. And so you, you want those uh, replacement heifers re well vaccinated prior to that first breeding season to make sure uh, th this is not in impacting your immediate fertility effect. And uh, th that's a good discussion to have with your veterinarian if you're using uh, modified live vaccines prior to breeding, when and how that fits into your situation. But just recognize the potential to influence your conception rates uh, based on how those animals might respond and, and what that time period is. So as we think about all these stressors, whether it's uh, heat or nutrition, um, disease, as we ask more and more of our animals, and I really think of this high producing dairy cow, that you know she, it, she shows stress sooner now because we're asking so much of her. All right, we've asked more and more of our, uh, whether it's the level of milk production in our beef cows, the rate of gain, the feed efficiency. I think Justin has some data that can document some of these changes we've seen in feedlot cattle. And you've probably heard some coffee shop discussion of calves that are gaining, you know, five pounds or better and great feed efficiency. Now, as we've selected for these traits, we've been effective, but what, how, does, how does that impact their ability to respond to some of these stressors? And so I just, uh, I think we need to think about that as we look at more weather variability and, and how we might deal with that. So uh, with that, I wind up there, and if there's any quick questions, or we can, uh, I think Justin's maybe need to load a slide, but uh, we can take any quick questions or uh, keep, keep them for our group discussion.